Good morning, Doolin's Grove. Happy Sunday, our second Sunday, not meeting together in person due to coronavirus, but still fellowshipping and worshiping together nonetheless. This morning will be a little bit longer than our daily devotions have been this week, and I really appreciate all of you who have been participating all week long in those and who are with us last Sunday and who are joining in with us this Sunday. Uh, Lynn, uh, Jira, I don't believe I've met before, but welcome. Meredith, lots of people joining in. Donnie, Donald, Smith. Hello, everybody. Good morning. I want to encourage you to make lots of comments. It's the closest thing that we're going to have during this time together to feeling like we're actually together. So read the comments, make comments, interact with one another. And with me, I can see them real time. I want to encourage you to put in the comments any prayer requests that you have right now. And I'll return to the importance of that during the message. Um, but it, it's good to share our prayer requests together. It's good to pray together and for one another. More on that later. Do keep in mind, though, that these will be public, so you might not want to add any private or personal details to the prayer request that you put in the comments. I'm going to pray for us as we begin, and I encourage you to pray where you are as well, and we'll, we'll pray together. Now, Father, thank you so much for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the forgiveness that you give to us through him. Thank you for his lordship and guidance. That we are not alone. We are not sheep without a shepherd. We have the good shepherd. And he protects us and he tells us which direction to go. And we're so grateful for that. Thank you for your Holy Spirit empowering us to be the church together, even when we're not able to be together physically like this. Thank you for your word and your voice through your word, teaching us, speaking to us, guiding us. Thank you for our fellowship that even though apart physically, we are still united in Christ, still in this together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ that we have, that we get to proclaim and hold to and celebrate. Lord, we ask during this time together in our living rooms and dining rooms and, and in our homes that you would enable us to genuinely worship you in spirit and truth together in a way that would carry on throughout the rest of our day and our week together in jesus name amen all right thank you guys for praying with me just catching up on who all has joined us it helps me to see in the comments and who has joined us again so i don't feel like i'm just talking to my laptop alone so you'll have to bear with me as I stand along. Oh, there's Anna. Hey, Anna and the Greg family. Norma, Lindsay, Phil, good to see all you guys with us and everybody that I've missed. Um, so I'm encouraging you guys to comment quite a bit while we're together during this time. I think we'll, I'll be uh, here doing this. It'd probably be a little less than an hour. But do share any prayer requests that you have. But also, I wanted to do something to facilitate a little bit of interaction to feel a little bit like we are together. This is something that we have usually done with the youth group when we get together on Wednesdays. And at the beginning of the session, we just go around and share what we call highs and lows. So we look back over the past week and we share a high, something good, a praise from the last week and a low, something that was more of a challenge. And it's just a way of getting back on the same page with, with each other and getting caught up on how our week has been. And I want to encourage you to do that in the comments over the next couple of minutes while I go through some announcements. Just a, a high and a low. It doesn't have to be the very best thing, the very worst thing, because that can paralyze you trying to figure out what that is. Just first thing that comes to mind, something good, something not as good over the last week as we reconnect with each other. You can put that in the comments. I want to encourage you after our time together to go to this YouTube link that I put in the description of the video and watch this introduction. It's an introduction to the book of 2 Corinthians through this ministry called The Bible Project. It's really cool ministry. They do this visual 
uh, drawing that comes together as they introduce the book, that'll kind of be in lieu of Sunday school this morning. That'll give you a little bit more of in-depth teaching about the book of 2 Corinthians. So after we get together, look for that YouTube link in the um, notes for this video. You can go check that out. I really only have one announcement that I'm going to share with you this morning, although I want you to keep in touch with the church website. Isaac is doing a really good job of keeping that up to date. But I wanted to let you know that this Tuesday evening, um, thank you, Meredith, getting the highs and lows started. You guys share in the comments. This Tuesday evening, the board is going to meet again, and we're going to reevaluate based on current recommendations when we might be able to come back together in person again and what that will mean for our Easter celebrations coming up. So I'm hopeful that midweek after the board meets and then uh, possibly I talk with some other church leaders that have to do with Easter, we'll have some answers and some details for you about our plans moving forward. As, as of right now, what we have said is that we were going to take a break for two weeks, which means we would come back together March 29th, I think, is that Sunday. I don't think any of us believe that that is going to work out based on the current recommendations, but We'll let you know officially after this Tuesday night. So be in prayer for our board members for wisdom as we make some decisions about all that together. All right, I see some highs and lows coming through. Uh, let's catch up with each other and read those. I want to read Psalm chapter 40, just the first three verses to ease us into our time together. Psalm chapter 40, verses 1 through 3. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a, song, a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. I think that's a good psalm for us this Sunday in the midst of all of this, that even when it all does seem a bit bogged down and there's a lot going on, there's a lot to be uh, stress, stressed out over, as God's people, we can trust that he will lift us up out of that and he'll put our feet on solid ground. We can trust in him, fear him rather than circumstances. And Lord willing, through that, Others will see and come to faith in God through Jesus Christ as well. It's a great opportunity for the kingdom in the midst of all of this. I just realized that my lamp is, it looks like it's shining out of the top of my head behind me. Let me try to reframe a little bit. There we go. That's better. Now, uh, in the course of our usual Sunday morning, we do some things that we're not going to be able to do here together. Uh, one of those things is sing together. I'm not going to lead us in any kind of awkward singing where you guys hear me and then you sing in your living room. Uh, there's people who are gifted and probably could do that. I'm not one of those people. You know that about me already, so I hope you're not disappointed there. You're probably relieved more than disappointed. Um, but Meredith, I saw, was posting some YouTube links to, to songs for musical worship, and I would encourage you to keep that up. Uh, in the Doolin's Grove Facebook group throughout the day. Any worship song that comes to mind, go ahead and share uh, with your church family. Another thing that we are not going to be able to do that we normally do is pass the offering plate. That's an important part of our weekly worship is uh, not just giving our time and our singing voices and our attention, but also giving of our resources to the work of the kingdom. Churches are going to be hurting financially after this, just like individuals will. Uh, most um, leaders and denominational leaders are kind of bracing themselves for the fact that this is going to create a financial strain on individual Christians, and that's going to filter through to church finances, denominational finances. And then there's just the logistics. If you're not here and present, there's a higher likelihood that you'll just forget to give or choose not to. So I just want to remind you there are ways to continue to worship through giving. Uh, on our church website, it's easy to find how to give through there. And if you prefer to mail it in, you can mail it to the church physical address. Those are both listed in the notes of this 
this video that I hope you can see pretty easily. If you're not comfortable mailing or doing it online, uh, shoot me a text or give me a call. You can come and just drop it off here. Uh, we'll figure out a way to do it while remaining socially distant from one another. But that, that remains important. I want to just keep that in your consciousness. I put a poll in the Facebook group asking parents to ask their children what have they found the most challenging during all this. And the top three answers I'll share with you are, they tied cabin fever, just uh, feel like you're going crazy stuck inside and stuck at home, missing friends, uh, just missing being with our friends, not that friends are missing, and that their parents are stressed out. And th those all ring true. I can see truth in all those. And I just want to let you know that all three of those are going to be addressed in the passage that we're going to look at for this morning's message. So stay, stay tuned and, and be listening for what God's Word has to say for us this morning in light of those, those challenges that even our children are facing. So that's all of the preliminary stuff for this morning. And I'm, I'm eager to get to the Scripture with you. I am still keeping an eye on the comments, though. If there's anything that you guys would like for me to address, I will try to. But we're going to go back to 2 Corinthians. Will Boston joined. Good morning, Will. I'm going to sip some coffee. This is also something I don't usually do on a Sunday morning, but I'm tired this morning. I woke up really early. I imagine you guys are drinking coffee where you are, too. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. These are the last two verses in this section that we've been looking at all week during the daily devotion. And just real quick, a reminder of why we're looking at this passage. I didn't pick this specifically because of the coronavirus and everything. This is just where we find ourselves in our course through Scripture. We started 2 Corinthians a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I went out of town last week, a week from, from this previous Thursday. We were out of town Thursday through Saturday, and I was finishing up preparing for Sunday one day. Kind of during my quiet time, I was praying through the next section in 2 Corinthians. And it, it occurred to me that I was seeing 10 distinct truths that would help us to think about affliction and comfort. And so I kind of sketched those out as 10 points. And I was trying to decide, should this be a 10-point long sermon? That would probably be way too much. Maybe I could break it into two sermons, five points each or something. I was just trying to figure out how to lay it out. And, and then all this came about. And by Saturday, we had decided not to meet for two weeks. And so I shared the first two points last Sunday. And you guys suggested that I do daily Facebook Live devotions. And it seemed like it would time out perfectly. So we did two points last Sunday, and then we've done a point a day, Monday through Friday. And now I have the final three of these 10 points. I want to remind you of what these, these 10 truths about affliction and comfort, what they are. But first, just a reminder about terms. Affliction in, in this passage of Scripture means uh, the problem that we face. Whatever the problem is, that's creating pressure, that's creating an issue for us, that's, that's what the affliction is. It's the issue. The passage also uses the term suffering. Suffering is the pain that that problem causes. So you have affliction and suffering. The problem and the pain that it's causing, how it feels. So we're clear on those terms. Another term is comfort. It is used a bunch of times throughout this whole passage. That doesn't mean just uh, that the feeling of pain goes away. Here it means God enabling you to endure the affliction. It's him giving you the power and the strength and the peace and the wherewithal to remain in the affliction however long he needs you to. That's what he means by comfort. So with all that in mind, here's the, the first seven points we went, we've gone over this week. And uh, you might want to jot them down. I probably phrased them differently throughout um, but th here's how I'm going to phrase them now. And this is based on the verses they came from. So it'll toggle back and forth between talking about affliction and suffering. But remember, they're connected. It's the problem and the pain. So the first truth, God comforts us 
in all our affliction. Number two, God comforts us so we can comfort others. Number three, great suffering comes with great comfort. Number four, affliction and comfort have purpose. Number five, affliction can be severe. I'm sorry. No, number five, I'm sorry, is we suffer and take comfort together. Number six is affliction can be severe. Number seven is affliction makes us rely on God. And I'll type these up and, and put them on the Facebook group so you don't have to, if you didn't catch all of that. Now we're going to talk about the eighth, ninth, and tenth points, and I'm going to go through them relatively quickly because they're pretty straightforward, but it's very helpful to be reminded of them. So the eighth truth about affliction and comfort from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it comes from verse 10, and it is, we hope in God's deliverance. That's number eight. We hope in God's deliverance. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and look at it, and I'll read from mine. This comes from verse 10 of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. So here's Paul. He has just described severe affliction and suffering that he had experienced in ministry. And now he's, he's continuing to write to and sort of discuss this with the Corinthian Christians. He makes this point that his hope in the midst of all this is in God's deliverance. We hope in God's deliverance. Christian hope is not wishful thinking. Christian hope is anticipation about something that you're sure is going to come about. So Christian hope is not lottery ticket hope. You go into the gas station and buy a lottery ticket. You might say, I hope I win. And what you mean is, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to win, but it'd be awesome if I did. That's not the way the Bible uses the word hope. The way the Bible the word uses the Bible uses the word hope is more the way we hope in the sunrise tomorrow morning. No matter how dark it gets tonight, we hope that the sun will rise and that we're certain it's going to rise because it it always rises. Christian hope is not wishful thinking like a lottery ticket. It's anticipation of something that we're sure is going to come about, like the sun rising. And here's how it works. The way Paul describes it is how hope works, and it's very applicable to us in the middle of all this. Hope stands in the present, and it looks back at the past and forward to the future, and it takes hold of both. So Christian hope looks back to the past and remembers that God has delivered us in the past. God has delivered his people in the past, he has been faithful to, to deliver me in the past, and it takes hold of those memories of God's past faithfulness in one hand, and it looks to the future at God's promises to come through and deliver in the future, and it takes hold of that, and therefore it is secure. That's what Christian hope is. That's how it operates. It stands in the present and takes hold of the past and the future in that whole 360 perspective and finds security in the presence in the present because of that. Um, a good example of this for me is back when I had to go to the orthodontist. Um, many of you probably had braces. I remember that experience of going to the orthodontist. I think uh, orthodontists have come a long way since I had braces. I remember long sessions sitting in that chair at the orthodontist with him poking and prying and dealing with all this metal in my teeth and hitting my gums and my mouth having to be stretched open for a long, it felt like hours. I don't know how long it took. It was so uncomfortable, uh, really miserable in that chair and just sitting there looking up, um, didn't have podcasts to listen to to take your mind off of it or anything like that. I can still remember some of the shapes in the ceiling tiles in the orthodontist's office sitting there enduring that discomfort of, of him prying around in my mouth. Now, sitting in that chair, I could hope, because I could look back remembering that 
during all the monthly sessions that led up to this, let's just say for a year prior, monthly sessions of enduring this, God saw me through each one. I made it through each of those monthly sessions. I could remember that while sitting in the orthodontist chair. Remember, I've made it through in the past and I could look to the future and know that God was going to see me through this as well. And eventually, however long it took, I was going to get out of that orthodontist chair. He was going to take all the, the stuff out of my mouth that was making my mouth stay open. I was going to leave the orthodontist office and I was going to get relief eventually. And so in the chair, in the midst of the discomfort, I could hope. That's how Christian hope works. In the midst of the affliction, you can remember that God has seen you through before and you can know that in the future he's going to see you through again. It's not always going to feel like this. It's not always going to be like this. That's Christian hope. And if you are really savvy, you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, aren't there times that God doesn't deliver? His people, haven't there been times in the Bible that he didn't deliver? Think about Israel in, in Egypt. Some of those people were born and died within that time period of slavery in Egypt. Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, if it be God's will to let the cup pass, and God didn't let the cup pass, so he didn't deliver him in that case. And what about Christian martyrs throughout history? Seemingly, God did not deliver them, but they were killed for their faith. So how does that factor into all of this? Well, it's a really good point. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, we have to remember as we think about God's deliverance that his timing and his ways and his purposes are higher than ours. So it may seem good to us for him to remove affliction from us within a certain time period, but he may know better that it should take longer to bring about his good purposes. Similarly, we may think based on our understanding that it would be good for him to remove the affliction from us Whereas he might know that to accomplish the very best things, we need to remain in it. Well, Jesus, for example, prayed, let your will be done and not mine. God's will is better than our will. We may not understand why he has us remain in affliction, but he definitely has good reasons for it. Uh, think about taking a, a young child in for medical care and they need to get a shot of some sort. That little child is not going to understand why you are holding them down while this pain is being inflicted upon them. They're going to think it should relent sooner than it is. They're going to think that it's bad. They don't understand what you understand as a parent. In the same way, we don't understand everything God understands when it comes to affliction and suffering. But we can hope in him that when it is good and right, he will deliver us in the way that he sees fit, in the way that is best. Even if that means martyrdom, that death is what is best in the grand scheme of things. We can fully trust him. So the application for us, I was thinking about the kids that the parents asked what kind of struggle are they having right now, and they said cabin fever is driving them crazy. A really simple application for us and our children in the midst of cabin fever is just to remember that God saw us through this last week of it. Many of us had a full week of being at home, homeschooling, figuring things out, and God saw us through it Sunday. We made it. We can trust that he's going to see us through this coming week as well, whatever comes up. And so we can have hope, even in that little minor affliction of cabin fever. It won't always feel like this. It won't always be like this. Eventually, this is going to pass. We're going to be okay. We can hope in God's deliverance. Now, that brings us to the next truth, truth number nine. We don't just have to sit here hoping. There's something we can do, and that is to pray. So truth number nine, prayer helps. Just two words for this one. Prayer helps. The first part of verse 11. Paul writes, You also must help us by prayer. You also must help us by prayer. Paul is asking the Corinthian Christians to help him and Timothy and those ministering with them by prayer. Just let that settle in for a minute. The Apostle Paul, so filled with the Holy Spirit and spiritual wisdom and spiritual power to be an apostle, to do groundbreaking, amazing ministry that we're still benefiting from today, he asked for prayer. 
he asked the, the normal everyday Christian of the Corinthian church to pray for him. And we should ask for prayer too when we are afflicted and suffering. We should ask people to pray for us. That's one way that we as Christians navigate affliction and suffering. Uh, that word help there is the idea of close cooperation. Praying for one another is a way that we can come alongside each other and work together in this kingdom project and work together through the bad things that we experience in life. Now, some of you are really good at this and some of you are really bad at this. Some of you might be thinking right now and you can't remember the last time you asked someone else to pray for you. Maybe you can remember the last time you prayed for somebody but when it comes to your own affliction and your own suffering, you try to just be tough. You try to muscle it through on your own. You're not the kind of person to ask for help and uh, maybe or maybe you're embarrassed to ask for people to pray for you or think you're too strong to need it. Well, let this be a corrective for you. Paul wasn't too strong to need prayer. It's not embarrassing. It's part of how God has designed the body of Christ to function. We need to pray for each other and we need each other to pray, pray for us. So there's two easy responses or simple, clear, easy to see responses, responses from this truth. First, we need to ask for prayer. That's why I was encouraging you and encourage you still to put any prayer requests you might have in the comments. Any way your brothers and sisters can support you in prayer right now, mention it in the comments. Feel, feel free to send Norma emails asking for prayer. That's what the prayer chain is there for. If you don't let us know, we don't know how to pray for you in specific ways. And we all miss out. So that's, that's one application of this truth. Ask for prayer. It's good. Prayer helps. The second is pray. Pray for one another. Intercede for each other. That should be a huge part of what we do as a church, is pray for one another. Be that go-to person that people know they can text you or email you or call you and ask for prayer, and they can rest assured that you will pray for them. I've got many of those in my life, many among our church who are faithful to pray for me, faithful to pray for their fellow Christians, um, the first and foremost example that always comes to my mind is my mom. I know that mom prays for me and my family, um, and our church even, and I know anytime I text her or call her, I can rest assured that she is going to follow through and pray, and there's a great sense of help that comes from that for me. I know it seems like whenever you hear something going on with someone that you need to solve it yourself, and you need to do something, and often there is something that you can do, but don't underestimate the power of prayer. Don't underestimate the importance of praying for someone before you even start trying to do for someone. It's important to God that we do this. He's designed it to work this way on purpose. Now, I've, I have a subconscious problem with prayer that I really only became aware of within the last decade. I have tended to feel like if God wants to do something, he'll do it. He doesn't need my input. I mean, clearly he knows better than I know what needs to be done, what people need. Uh, why would he need my input through prayer? Well, it's not that he needs it. It's that he wants it. He wants us to pray for a lot of different reasons, many of which just have to do with um the fact that it's a relationship we have with him. But there's another specific reason that he wants us to pray, and uh, that's our final point, the tenth truth about affliction and comfort from 2 Corinthians 1. It comes from the second part of verse 11, and that's this. So the eighth point was we hope in God's deliverance. The ninth point was prayer helps. And the tenth and final point Prayer makes praise. Prayer makes praise. It generates praise. Look at the second part of verse 11. First part says, You also must help us by prayer. Now the second part. So that many will give thanks on our behalf 
for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Why does Paul want them to pray for, them, for him? So that many would give thanks on their behalf for the blessing granted through the prayers of many. That's one of the reasons God wants us to intercede for one another and pray for one another because prayer generates praise. God is sovereign. He doesn't need us to alert him of needs. Uh, he's not like me. I need my children to let me know of things they need. Sometimes I'm not aware or I, I forget. God doesn't forget, and he is aware. He's never, when you intercede for your fellow Christian, God is never surprised to hear it. Oh, I didn't know such and such was struggling with that. Thanks for telling me. I had no idea. That's not how it works. He wants us to pray because he wants us to praise and he wants many people to pray about the same issue, one issue, because he wants many people to praise him when he comes through in response to prayer for that issue. He doesn't just want to care for us. He wants us to celebrate how he has cared for us. And that, that might seem egotistical, and it would be egotistical for anyone other than God. But God knows that the, <clears throat> the highest good, <clears throat> excuse me, the highest good in reality is worship. That's the best for us. That's the best thing that can happen is that he receive worship. And so he pursues that by encouraging us to pray so that when he comes through, we will, we will praise. One example from our family's life with this uh, was Lillian's migraines. Many of you remember a couple of years back, Lillian uh, around Thanksgiving started getting these migraines and she never used to get migraines and um, it was very mysterious they were really severe and intense and frequent and it was really freaking us out we you know you're as a parent you start googling and you start to worry about brain tumors and uh, start to get really concerned and we were seeing a lot of doctors I remember taking her in to do uh, whatever that medical test is where they put all the little diodes all over her head and she needed and she had to sleep while they checked out her brain and all those things it was pretty scary for us um and we recruited a lot of prayer during that time and you guys our church family prayed for lillian and i remember sunday it was new year's day fell on a sunday we brought lillian up to the front of the church and everybody gathered around we prayed over her we prayed for her and it was if my memory is terrible but i'm pretty sure that very next week we finally got an answer as to what was going on with those migraines uh it had to do with how she was responding to getting strep throat which she was getting frequently uh, her body would respond with these intense headaches figuring that out enabled us to figure out how to treat them and i don't think she's had a migraine since now we gave a lot of thanks to god for that but because we had recruited such a large team of people praying that Thanksgiving didn't end with us. It spread out through all those people who had been praying. We got to share the answered prayer with all those people who had helped us in praying. So the more praying, the more praising, the more people praying about a thing, the more people will later praise God when he comes through and answering that prayer related to that thing. I hope that makes sense. Um, it, it's, it's just another beautiful facet of the way God has designed all this to work. So ask for prayer. However you may be afflicted, however you are suffering, ask for prayer. Not only will it help you, it will generate praise when you're able to later share how God came through that prayer request. Meredith reminded me of a detail I had forgotten that she actually had a migraine during church and after the prayer never had another one. Praise God. We're still praising God. We can all still celebrate that together. I know there's many other examples of that beyond just that one. So that's it. Those are the 10 truths about affliction and comfort. And like I said, I'll type those out when we're all done here so you can see them all in place. But I want to just kind of bring them all together and let's just kind of visualize what it would look like for this passage to be fully functioning in in our lives so imagine a scenario in which you are really stressed out 
Some of you, this does not require much imagination at all. So you're really stressed out. Uh, if kids are listening, let's say you're really stressed out because your mom and dad are really stressed out. This passage at work would, would make it feel like this. Um, you would remember as you feel that tightness in your chest, that um, more shallowness of breath, that preoccupation in your mind of, of the tension, the things you're, you're wrestling with and thinking about, you remember God comforts us in all of our affliction. He cares about this stress that I'm feeling. And he will comfort me in it because the Bible tells me to, so it tells me so. So I will start to draw near to him in prayer. I know that he is disposed to comfort me in this affliction. This passage also reminds me that God comforts us so that we can comfort others. So I know in this stressful feeling that I can draw near to him and he'll comfort me. And not only that, he's not just going to help me to feel better. He's going to enable me to help others to feel better. So I'm going to draw near to him, but I'm also going to start paying more attention to other people around me. So I'm not going to be paralyzed in this stress and just seek um, distraction or anything like that. And I'm not going to just fold inward and be all about me, me, me. Why do I feel this way? I'm going to start to look outward and notice the people around me and look for how I can comfort them with the comfort that God has given to me. I'm also going to remember that with great suffering comes great comfort. So no matter how intense the suffering seems to get, I know God's going to answer that with equal comfort. So I can rest assured with that. I don't need to be terrified. This isn't out of control. This isn't out of God's control. I can remember that this affliction and comfort have purpose. It would be so terrible to think that all that this stress was meaningless. And, and vain, but it's not. I know that God is using this to bring about awesome things. I can remember that we, as part of the church, we suffer and take comfort together. So I'm not alone in this. There are others who are also suffering that I can ease their suffering. There are others who are receiving comfort from God who can comfort me, and we're all participating in this suffering and comfort together. I'm not by myself. Even though I'm socially distanced, from people, I'm not by myself. We're in this together. I can remember, based on scripture, that affliction can get pretty severe, so I can brace myself for the fact that it may get worse before it gets better. I don't have unrealistic expectations. I know that that's part of life in this fallen world. I can know that affliction makes me to rely on God, which is good. So I can lean into that. When I feel the, the stress or the anxiety, I can lean into the fact that one purpose I know God is working out in this is that he's going to help me rely on him more. So I can pray in that direction. Father, help me to rely on you more in this, to endure and to make it through. I can actively hope in God's deliverance. I can sit down and think back and remember the times that he has seen me through other affliction and suffering. And I can use that, along with looking to the future, to secure hope that it's not always going to feel like this. It's not always going to be like this. He's, he has seen me through in the past. He will see me through in the future. So I can endure in the present. And in the midst of all of this, taking just strengthened by all this truth, I can ask for prayer. I know I've got my church family, um, fellow Christians. I'll ask them to pray for me. That I know is going to help me, and I can keep in mind who's praying for me so that when God delivers me, I can let them know, hey, you, you were helping me by prayer. Well, he came through. He helped me to endure, and God is awesome. That's, that's how this works. That's how this passage will work itself out in us. So that is it. Ten truths about affliction and suffering and comfort from this week. Uh, and in the week to come, I'm going to continue doing daily devotions at 3 o'clock. May even have some special guests to share some uh, devotions at 3 o'clock, Monday through Friday. And the plan right now is just to keep moving on through 2 Corinthians because all of God's Word is profitable, it's living and active, and I trust that it will be applicable every day. But that's not to say we may not have a special 
passage that comes to mind um, and uh, that we might deviate from it. We're, we're open to the Holy Spirit's guidance in all these things. So that is all. You guys have been awesome commenting. I've got a lot of comments to catch up on. They were coming too fast for me to catch up real time. Uh, but I love to see you guys committing to pray for one another. That is great. Keep that up. I want to end our time together this morning with a classic biblical benediction to see us off together. You can continue the conversation, though, in the Facebook group and, and with each other over the phone. But this will be the final word from me during this time together this morning. This is Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Love you guys.